Well, thank you, Sean. Thank you so much for uh, being here. I'm going to probably move the lectern or at least move away from it because I feel like I need to connect with my instrument. It's all the way out there, so it's like, ah, oh, i got to really get out there. Anyway, how many of you know a trumpet when you see it? Okay, how many know a trumpet when you hear it, right? It's really not that hard to decipher. What kind of music, though, does a trumpet play? Any volunteers? Any, no? Orchestral. Orchestral music, okay. In an orchestra, what is the character of music that the instrument might play? Anyone? Fanfare. Fanfares. Somebody else said? Celebratory. Celebratory. All right. Military music, royalty, celebratory, all of those things are true. But why? Why is it that that happened that way? Well, part of it is because of how the instrument was constructed. Part of it was because of the loudness. Uh, some people might call it obnoxiousness um, of the instrument and the timbre it produces. Uh, it also sent calls from town to town, over hill and valley, etc., to let the next town know, oh, this is what's happening. There's an entire book by Ben Dinelli allowing the one town to see all of the different calls and send them to the next and decipher it, similar to what we would have known as Morse code, for instance. Um, very similar in that regard. Um, moving forward, though, I'd like to go through a brief discussion of the history of the instrument, a little bit about the physics. I'm not a physicist, so anyone who might be very entrenched in math, please don't judge, if you will. I'm not going to go too much into the physics, um, certainly none of the math involved therein. Um, part of that is going to be the harmonic series, uh, the music that was written for the time and the construction of the instrument that was there, at the, and the valve, its introduction to the instrument and how it changed the game for trumpets, uh, if you will. There's going to be plenty of musical examples this evening. I'll play a couple so you can hear what some of these instruments sound like, but on the whole I figured I would try to uh, go with the noise policy that the library has here and try to keep it down just a little bit. That said, let's take a look here at the current three-valved instrument that everybody knows. Okay? Everybody seen this instrument before? Mm -hmm. Nothing unfamiliar, right? This is the modern trumpet. It has the three valves, mm -hmm. it has the slides connected to those valves, as well as the one that connects all the way to the, the mouthpiece, and then out the bell. And we'll talk about why it's constructed that way, etc. There's also the cornet. Now, it's not as widely used in American wind bands today, but still prevalent. The rotary trumpet, used primarily in Central Europe in countries like Germany, the Czech Republic, Switzerland. Uh, it's made a huge renaissance here in the United States over the last, I would say, 20 to 30 years. Music of the classical era is being played on these primarily because of the timbre differences or the sound quality, if you will. So, Time to get to the history of the instrument. Early man decided, hey, there's something in this. <laughs> yeah, there's something in it, all right. <laughs> hey, Steve. <laughs> right? So, all of a sudden, not only did they find a way to make noise, if you will, but they found a way to communicate. You know, one, one long and two short. Hi. I don't know. I, I, have, I have no literature from, from that era to let me know what that might have been. But that's where it started. And in early history, we also see uh, literature from Greek civilization. We also see in Hebrew civilization um, animal horns, metal instruments that were actually present at the first Olympic Games, the salpinks, if you will. There was competitions even on that, just the same as there were on all the athletic events. And awards of the laurels and everything were given accordingly. So one of the first brass instruments, if you will, not brass at all, but rather of bone. You good? Yeah. All right, wonderful. Pointed the wrong direction that time. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> several years later, in fact, several centuries later, came the uh, natural trumpet, if you will. And this is something that I actually made last summer from flat sheet brass. And I bent it all together, soldered it, pounded it out. And I'll try to show a little bit of that process here in a little bit. Well, it sounds quite a bit different as well. <laughs> So 
we start to hear how a melody can finally be produced. Now I've skipped way ahead, don't get me wrong. There are several steps between this and this, but I don't own any of those instruments. So I felt that this was probably the next apropos, apropos place to be. And we'll talk about, again, all of this and how it really relates here in just a little bit. All right, we have the making process. This is actually what I started with when I was making this instrument. Right there. All of it, flat. There was nothing done for me. It was all right there, flat. And I brought up a web page, if I can quickly do this for you, and that I have the sound off because it's death metal in the background. But we can see how this gentleman is cutting out all of the sheets of brass. And I'm not going to let it go the whole nine minute length because that would kind of defeat the purpose of having a speaker. But I do want to let you see a little bit with what happens here in the process. This is modern. This gentleman is actually making a flugelhorn. And because the flugelhorn has a bit bigger of a bell, it's a little bit more obvious to see the process. So he's turning the bell over a mandrel, and then he's heating it and he'll pound it out, etc. What he's doing right now is annealing the metal so it's easier to work with. After it's worked for a while, metal actually hardens so you can't work with it too well. So there's the heating process and the working process and the heating process and the working process. And so I had to do that with every segment of this instrument uh, in order to make a functioning instrument. If anybody's interested after we're done here tonight, I do have a book that shows a little bit more about the process, but I felt a video was probably more um, appropriate for this particular setting. I think we're gonna go ahead and let that go. What's that? Oh, that's my daughter. Okay. I thought somebody had a comment. I should have known that little voice. Now, the Baroque trumpet. Can anybody see from where you are what the difference is between what's there on the screen and this here? Other than the ones on the screen are shiny and you don't already know the answer, Mr. Mac. Jack? There's no mouthpiece? Well, there's no mouthpiece. Now what? <laughs> Larger bell and an extra loop. Okay, kind of a little bit larger of a bell, more flare, if you will. So we're starting to get to the point where it's uh, more projecting. <clears throat> the extra loop is actually here. I just don't have it in right now. It's called a crook. Anybody? Can you, if you look really closely, you can see there are little vent holes along this tube. See them? Real closely. And I'm not a lefty. That's why it's a little out of whack there. Everybody see those? I'm helping. Okay. What those are designed to do is correct intonation issues. And this was a common problem, and we'll look again. I'm going to be going cyclically all night long here, so I hope you stay with me. Because of the issues that each generation had with the instruments that they were presented with, there was this constant desire to make them better, which ingenuity, right? Necessity is the mother of invention, as they say. So they found that by placing holes at specific places along what's called the second yard, first yard, second yard, all right, they could, f they could correct some of the pitches. Now, I'm going to play this, and I'll draw your attention back to it here in a little bit. We get very wide musical intervals, big distances. <laughs> And they can they start to compress. Okay, so that's all done by the player. There's nothing mechanical involved in this instrument whatsoever. Well, with the Baroque trumpet, you could actually tune some of those out of tune notes. It will allow you to play some chromatic pitches and better notes in tune. And I'll play a little bit more in a bit. Now the keyed trumpet. This was the next innovation after the Baroque trumpet. And what this looks like is that if the saxophone and the bugle kind of had, had a baby, this is kind of where we would be. We had the brass instrument with the bell and the mouthpiece, and we have all the keys, kind of like what a saxophone or a clarinet or you know a flute might have. All right. Same way that we would vent holes on the Baroque trumpet, they decided to apply the key system to the trumpet, and lo and behold, we had a keyed trumpet. Very famous trumpet concerto, the Haydn trumpet concerto, was written for the keyed trumpet. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with 
me calling it the Haydn Trumpet Concerto. And so on. So um, that was originally written for the keyed trumpet. Now, anecdotally, Haydn was a gigantic jokester. So you, know, you could only play a few rather spaced apart notes on this guy. And so when unveiling this, when unveiling this in 1795, Anton Weidegger had this new keyed, new keyed trumpet. And all of a sudden, you have this large introduction by the orchestra. And what does Haydn have the trumpet player do? <laughs> Seriously, like, I, that's, that's not even a joke. I mean, I'm being legitimate here. It's like, introduction, 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 introduction. <laughs> 40 more bars. It's, it's kind of ridiculous to think about it, but we all know, well, I shouldn't say we all, but if you're interested in how much of a jokester Haydn was, look up the Surprise Symphony. He thought he was a little bit tired of people going to sleep. I don't have any of those in here today. But we, we had the Surprise Symphony, right? And then loud note out of nowhere, right? Wake the audience up. So he's always constantly looking for ways to incorporate musical jokes. And this was just one of those. Now, we get to the physics portion of the presentation. It's not overly involved, so I apologize if you came expecting a physics lecture this evening. But I do want to show that there's a big difference between just the straight tube and a tube that has a mouthpiece on one end that is actually conical as it goes in and a flared bell. These three recordings are actually done with the same piece of PVC pipe each of these three recordings. The first one is done on the pipe alone, no mouthpiece. The second one is done on the pipe, no mouthpiece still, but with a bell flare added. And then the third one is a mouthpiece with the pipe and the bell flare. Sounds kind of funky. Has no correlation with what we heard a little bit ago. Okay, it's starting to sound a little better. Imagine that, it's just the bell. And that has to do with the node and anti-node that we uh, incorporate here on the trumpet. The sound is actually reflected back once we get to the atmospheric pressure. So it's actually reflected back toward the mouthpiece. That in mind, finally, and I, maybe you all know this. And all of a sudden, everything works. Okay, so like I said, there was a substantial distance between this guy and this guy. And one of the things that the things they discovered were about the mouthpiece and the bell. Now to tie it all back together, we have to talk about the harmonic series. The harmonic series is what allows the trumpet to play a variety of notes. I'm sorry, I keep on stepping in front of you. I'll do no, one. I... So we notice that we have very low in the bass clef through very high. All right? Now I started on the second pitch, and I'll do it again. Now, anybody in here have perfect pitch? Good, because that's not a C. It's a D flat. Trumpets are pitched in whatever key the piece was for the time. Many pieces of the Baroque era and a little before were in the key of D. Trumpets and drums, yay, very heroic. We talked about that. Uh, a little bit earlier. So this was pitched in that. Now I'm going to go ahead and attempt to play that lowest note. So we have that. Okay. So where did the notes start to get really close together? When I started to get very high up. And that became kind of an en vogue thing to do for a very long time. However, people's ears got tired of the same key of trumpet, the same key of piece, the same kind of sticky melodies, if you will. Um, notice there, there's not all that great of note cluster here. It's pretty well the same chord until you get about here, with the exception of the seventh. And then we get almost a scale and then a couple chromatic pitches through the highest of notes. 
So not only does it get boring for your listener, it gets extremely difficult for your player, extremely difficult to make the notes sound clear and heroic, right? Well, if I stayed all day long down here, it's all right, no big deal. But there's no possibility for melody. And that's where the next slide really comes in, is the valve. The advent of the valve in 1814 was really, really a watershed moment, if you will, for the instrument, not just the trumpet, but also the horn. In fact, the valve was originally applied to the horn, what we, a lot of many people would call the French horn. We see how the valve functions. It, it stays up, it allows the air to flow, you press it down, and the air flows through an additional set of tubing. Well, there's been a debate for years and years and years until the mid-90s when John Erickson actually discovered a letter from Heinrich Sturzel to the King of Prussia in 1814, dated December 6. And bear with me if I, if I will read this to you. Most illustrious, most mighty king, most gracious lord and majesty, the horn to which I have chiefly dedicated myself is most defective as regards the inequality of its notes and the impossibility of producing them with the same purity and strength. This fact often made me very impatient and led me to make experiments which might alleviate the problem, which at the beginning were all failures, but which finally led me to an invention which rewarded me for all my trouble and satisfied my demands on the instrument. My horn can play all the notes from the lowest to the highest with the same purity and strength without having to stop the hand into the bell. Now, the reason I bring this up is because we kind of take the valve for granted. If you look at all these instruments from this point forward, they all have valves. They all have valves. Modern instruments all have valves because, and I told you I would get back to this, this little guy right here called a crook, called a crook. We can add that to the length of the overall instrument. And what happens to it then? Anyone? It gets longer. When it gets longer, what happens to it? It gets lower. So let me remind you briefly before I play the, with the crook. Okay. Now that's the key of Baroque D or modern D flat. So, it's substantially lower, right? Well, the debate that was forever was, was the valve invented to create chromaticism, which we know today is the fact, and by this letter is the fact, or was it to quickly change the crook from one to the next? Because some music, starting in the uh, early 18th century, sorry, early 19th century, began to do exactly that. Started to say trumpet in whatever key, and then trumpet in whatever key. For instance, like a trumpet in F to a trumpet in E flat. Okay, well all of these things, all of these things are true. They needed to quickly change. But the valve was not one of them. And from that point, we get to our modern instruments. And I told you I wouldn't play a whole lot, but I'm going to a little bit more right now. So I talk about the chromaticism. Okay, so that's two octaves playing every note in between. However, Okay, well, it, it, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. It's exactly the same concept. Now, we talk about the valve and everybody goes, oh, well, that's nice, you can move your fingers. You don't have to move them as quickly as the flute saxophone or clarinet. <laughs> but you have to move your fingers. But you, you know, it's only three. But what is the valve doing? <laughs> You hear how that's exactly the same? Just a little lower each time. That one little tube, one by itself, 
creates a situation where now every single note is lowered by half. So I automatically have all of those notes and then a half step lower. Well, this tube right here is worth one. It's a whole step or a whole tone. Okay, press that down and I have the same harmonic series just down a step. Well, as I add them up, I can get even further and further down until I have chromatic ability from the lowest all the way up through the highest. Okay, so that's really important to note because it isn't until 1814 that that really started to take off and then once it did, it was very quick in development, which we'll see here in just a moment. But I want to go back briefly and talk about the ensemble music for the time. So, Bach, anybody? Dates. 1685 to 1715. Okay, so we're talking late 17th century through mid 18th century, right? Check it out. You, oh, goodness, what in the world did I do there? Sorry, folks. All of those notes can be played over here. Now, I'm not going to attempt that today. I'm going to give you something that may be a little bit more familiar. Right? Okay? My wife should know. She came down the aisle to that. As she looks around embarrassedly. <laughs> okay. However, I told you that at this point, though, people kind of got tired of hearing all of the high notes, the same kind of sticky stuff. So they went back to the meat notes, if you will, those notes that were the most powerful. I was just speaking with Mr. Grimes before this lecture began, and <laughs> before I actually told him, he knew exactly what I was talking about. Piano Concerto Number no. 24 by Mozart of the classical era has exactly three pitches for the trumpet. Has the lowest written C, has a middle G, and the C in the staff. That's it. Now he had access to a lot more notes, but he only wanted that. And if you listen closely, it'll be paired with drums, which is very common. As we continue forward in ensemble music, we get Beethoven, 1805, Leonore Overture Number no. 3. This is off stage. This harkens way back to the communication I was talking about. In his opera Fidelio, this is a military scene. And the trumpet is at a distance. So again, though, if we go back and take a look at the harmonic series, these notes, not so much this one, but these four, they outline a C major chord. And if we go forward back to that same Beethoven excerpt, we'll notice that's it. Those are the only notes that are present. Still using, in 1805, before the invention of the valve, exactly those notes. Now, I bring this up, Symphony Fantastique of 1830 by Hector Berlioz, because nobody knew what to expect of this new trumpet, this new valve. Nobody knew to trust it or not to trust it. Was it a passing fancy or here to stay? Nobody knew. So he actually took the step of using it while still keeping the tradition from before. The tromba in E-flat signify straight trumpets. The cornetti in B also are signified with pistons or with valves. So you can look here as well. The top line is the, is the E-flat part. You'll notice, and this isn't the greatest resolution up here. I apologize for that. Only the notes from the harmonic series. But here we have C-sharp from the key signature, 
and then a C natural. Very chromatic passage against one that was still confined to the harmonic series. All right? Now, I don't have the sound bite for it, but this one. Now, there's chromatics all over the place here, isn't there? All over the place, almost every note for that matter. This is what happens when you get into uh, C sharp minor and you're playing notes written up above a step, so D sharp minor. For those uh, music students who are thinking about it, that's why there's accidentals everywhere. Now, why would I bring this up here in this presentation? Because all this music that I'm discussing with you is continuing to look back to, hey Steve, right? All of it, it all has some sort of character of military or royalty or something that has it less than a melodic instrument. Trumpets out front, if you will, out front of the charge, exactly where the uh, infantry of the time put its musicians as well, which is why instruments from the Civil War actually had bells that faced backwards. Even in our modern band tradition, in 1921, the trumpet parts are still looking like the harmonic series. They're still paired with trumpets and drums. Now you're not going to hear too much of this because they're playing way in the background of the music. But this is from probably one of the most famous band pieces in existence, and that's Holst's first suite for military band, an E flat. And on and on it goes. Trumpets with drums, trumpets with drums. I thought this would be fun to, to bring up too. Trumpets, drums, royalty or power, if you will. If I can get the mouse over there. Seems kind of funny, right? It's the same thing. So those of us that play trumpet, you'd think we'd get bored with it after a while because it's the same stuff most of the time. We'll see here shortly in solo music how we still look back while providing new innovations, if you will, toward what we're dealing with. In 1859, J.B. Arben produced his complete conservatory method for cornet or trumpet. If you look, this is one of the first of his 14 characteristic studies that happened in the back of his book. It's a 450 plus page book, and this is the last thing that's in there. The culmination of all the studying. And what does he start off with? With the exception of the second note, or the lower neighbor tone, it's the same thing. The very first one of all the combination, I actually have to put my instrument back together, don't I? <laughs> you think that's funny. I should, I should have talked about a different piece. But anyway. <laughs> and on and on it goes. Now, do I think about how the harmonic series changes with every note that I play, with every fingering that I press down? Absolutely not. That would make me a terrible musician. It might make me a good trumpet player, but it would make me an awful musician. And this is just a vehicle to make music. All right? So you see, Oligar's Entrada of 1947, still this fanfare figure, still this fanfare figure. We can't get away from it. Now we think that this would be a little nicer because, oh, we see a piano there. It can't possibly be the same thing. Really? And an echo, like it's a further hill. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. 
So we have Tomasi's Concerto for Trumpet, 1948, probably his most famous piece that he wrote during his entire career. He wrote sonatas and etudes and concertos for all variety of instruments, but the trumpet concerto remains his most popular to this day. But the opening lick, which appears in the middle of the piece as well, oh goodness, why did it do that? Click on it. So in this regard, Tomasi is taking something that's very much expected of a trumpet, but he places it in all kind of different chromatic representations. So he's using the lineage of the trumpet cleverly, finally, with the mechanism of the instrument. It isn't until the 20th century where unaccompanied trumpet really becomes a thing, but as you can see, once again, oh wait, new key because we can do that with valves. And maybe the most distance placed between, but still in this laid out arpeggiated fashion. And that actually concludes my presentation. There's some references if you're interested in looking a little bit further. Um, questions, and, and I'd be happy to answer any of those questions, and we'll have some time to play at the end. Anybody who's interested in playing? No questions. <laughs> I got it all, did I? Comment. Got one question here first. What made you want to start playing from it? Had three buttons. <laughs> <laughs> and I picked it up, and I went. <laughs> And it was loud. And I was like, sweet! <laughs> it's, that's what made me want to play trumpet. And how old were you at the time? 10. <laughs> I'm still doing <laughs> 25 years later. So must have been a good decision. I still do that. <laughs> yes, ma'am. It's interesting what you said about to be a good musician, you can't just think of each note and the correct. You have to get in the zone, don't you? Yeah, kind of. Like uh, athletes. Absolutely. I, I liken uh, trumpet playing to athletics all the time. Yeah. My students can tell you that. Um, I also like in trumpet playing to everything else in life as well, but that's, <laughs> that's a different story, I suppose. Any other questions? Comments? Intrigued at anything? Yes? Do you also have a compendium of situations where the trumpet isn't used in this typical fashion? Well, there's all kinds of etude books that are used as far as that goes. Um, I, I don't know if you're in speaking in reference to my website at all that actually has a lot with how the trumpet is used in an orchestra. There's a lot of excerpts in that that show the trumpet is far more than just fanfares, etc. But uh, I wanted to add a little bit of humor into my presentation tonight. And which, which do you prefer? Do you prefer to go with the fanfare tradition or? Well, the fan fanfare tradition is really nice because, I don't know, I guess it doesn't make me sound like a, a great musician, but it, it gives the trumpet player quite a bit of responsibility and power. And it's good to sit in the back of an ensemble and just lay it down and to kind of, and it's, it's kind of funny though, the idea of communication with a trumpet is one that holds true in an ensemble today in that the trumpet is really the one that dictates how hard something is articulated, how loud the ensemble gets, what the style of a particular area is. So in that regard, it's still communicating to this day. So the lineage of the trumpet from its early days, it's, it's still present no matter what or how. So yes, it's very good to play in the fanfare style, but to be honest with you, as I, the more I get older, I enjoy playing lyrical music more. It's more challenging than playing really loud. <laughs> anybody else? Anybody want to? Anybody have a lot of mental fortitude and want to show off in front of everybody else? Play some trumpet? Nobody? Nobody actually wants to play. I brought all of these horns. I want to play. 
Does anybody want to hear what any of them sound like before they would choose to play? I want to hear Jim. Can you play all of these with the same mouthpiece? No, not all of them. Most of them, yes. I can play the same mouthpiece here, 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 and here. But there's more specialized mouthpieces that are required for here, here, and here. Now, rather than me just saying here, most of these are straight up trumpets. Trumpet, trumpet, although it has a different set of valves. The rotary valve, although that one's stuck because I haven't played it in a while. So rotary valve turned this way instead of up and down. Um, this is a cornet. This is a flugelhorn. This is a piccolo trumpet, E flat trumpet, and this is a this is called a P trumpet because it's made out of PVC plastic entirely. There's no metal involved. Yeah, sure. Well, this is the standard B-flat trumpet. I played a little bit ago, but I'll play again. Many of these are pitched in B-flat, which you can get into that if people really want. So a little bit of a different timbre. This is just another B-flat trumpet, but I'll play it anyway. This is one of my students' horns. <laughs> Try that again. It's a little different. It's plastic. <laughs> this is actually my daughter's horn. I got it for her last Christmas, right after she turned three, and she can buzz a mean G and a C on it. So far. Can everybody sing the pitch I was just playing? Mm -hmm. no. Oh. Bass pitch is E flat. Okay. So it's a bit higher pitched. I'm not going to attempt to go quite so high on this horn. Quite small. It does have four valves, and it's an additional set of tubing to the fourth valve. So because it is a higher instrument, piccolo trumpet, this allows for um, lower playing, as well as some uh, better intonation in a few places. I'm trying to see if I've missed anything. Ooh, yeah. Cornet and the flugelhorn. And most everybody's favorite. Okay. And that's as far as that goes. Yes. Can you play flat of the bumblebees? <laughs> no. <laughs> now it's been a long time, so forgive me. It's the beginning of it. <laughs> yes. Which one is your favorite to play and or listen to? I hate them all. <laughs> No, if I if I had to pick the horn that that I am most fond of, it's it's going to be my C trumpet. I don't even think I played this one. And that's a big difference between a lot of these horns up here. Is most of them are playing in a key that just like the harmonic series that was up there, written in C but heard in a different pitch. This is the only one up here that is playing in the pitch that's written which is kind of ironic considering most of the music that's written for um, orchestral trumpet is written in a key other than C, and so I have to change it all anyway. Anybody else? Yes? Why, when you get higher in the harmonic series, do the notes get closer together? Because of physics. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna talk too much be, because I'm, I would run the danger of being really wrong. But um, 
physics dictates that the the wave in a closed system, closed air system, which this technically is because I'm closing it here. It's open out here, but it's closed here. The open air system is like a flute where it's open both across the hole and on the end. Um, but because it's a closed system, it actually should function a lot more like a clarinet. So that my first couple notes end up being like so that they're an octave and a fifth apart. Um, but because of the reflecting point in the flared bell and the uh, conical shaped mouthpiece, it actually allows access to that second, fourth, and sixth, and so on partials, because otherwise I'd only have access to the first and third and fifth and seventh, etc. Did everybody else get that? <laughs> this is where I should have paired up this lecture with a physicist. <laughs> Anyone else? Anybody really want to play? Brini, you said you want to play. Yeah, sure. Now you have a little bit of an advantage because you've done this before. What what instrument would you like to play? I'll just take your B flat short. Okay, we'll grab the spray and we'll. You so say you want to play flugelhorn? No. No. <laughs> yeah, nuh uh. Go ahead and wipe that out so it's not alcohol in your mouth. Yeah, it's fine. Book What's that? Book killer. No. That's, that's an E flat, but that's oh, just be oh, careful. Sure. You're welcome to it. I'll get is how can somebody play higher? How do you play higher on the instrument? Well, we talked about just a little bit of the physics, of course, about how the sound wave, it actually bounces through the pipes and then comes back to the lips. So there has to be an increase in air pressure and in velocity of the air in order to create the wave doubling. So. Well, you're playing E flat, so you're playing substantially higher than what you're normally playing. You're playing what would be an F on the B flat trumpet. Now play, play a G on the instrument, one and three, and that's and that's where your C would be over here. Okay, so that's part of the reason why you're struggling with that right now. Clarinet player. Yeah, I'm so. clarinet. <laughs> Anybody who's never played a trumpet in here? Sean! Sean, you'd be the perfect specimen for this. Yeah. Oh, I, I'm just too shy. <laughs> Sophia? I never played it, though. Come on. I don't know how to do that. Before. We're going to look at it real quick. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so you play flute, yes? Yes. Okay, first of all, I'll clean that out so I... I just sprayed it so you don't get the uh, alcohol from it in your mouth. Just use that under your shirt. There you go. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to actually have you do is blow through the instrument, not the instrument, the mouthpiece, with your lips kind of together and just blow. <laughs> really hard. A little harder. Okay, now as you're blowing hard, kind of touch your lips together as the air parts through them. So, <laughs> there it was. Good. Go ahead, a little bit more. Good. Never forget that air. Never forget that air. Now take your left hand and wrap it around the valves. Left hand. Go ahead. Wrap it around the valve. Now you're going to hold it with your left hand only. Okay. Now put your right hand up here. So you're playing one, two, three. One, two, three. All right. Now do the same thing with the mouthpiece now in the trumpet. Don't worry about it. Yeah, that's really very good. Now do a lot. Do a lot. Like move them all around. Yeah, it sounds like me playing jazz. It works out. All right, that's very good. That's very good. How, how much of your knowledge of playing flute helped you produce a sound on here, though? Just 
Yep. <laughs> Pretty much. Pretty much. Pretty much. You just use air very similarly, keep it going, and you just kind of focus that air using your lips and you're in good shape. Okay? Any other questions or comments or anybody else wanting to play? Any of the horns. Even even the homemade one, if you will. Um, can I play? Sure. What, you want to play this one? Um, sir. Okay. Now, just like I showed Sophia, I'm going to have you wipe out the mouthpiece. Boing. Uh, wipe it out first so you don't get alcohol in your mouth, because it's just rubbing alcohol. Okay. Now, what I want you to do before you get the mouthpiece up, I knew that she could play because she plays flute for me. Um, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to blow air, just go like a P. No, no, no mouthpiece yet. Like you're saying the letter P. Get your tongue back in your mouth, though. <laughs> okay, now get your lips in the mouthpiece and blow and see if we can get a sound. Go ahead. Yep. Okay, your lips have to touch. There you go. Good. Not bad. There you go. You hear how it's vibrating just a little bit? Blow a little harder while they continue to touch. Okay. Now, I'm going to go ahead and hold this. All right, go ahead and put the mouthpiece in. I'm going to go ahead and hold this. You're welcome to wrap your hand around the valves. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So your thumb will go here. There you go. Oh, Good. Okay. Now, hold it up just to make sure it doesn't drop. Now, same way. Same way that you start. Go ahead. The lips have to touch or they won't vibrate. Very good. Have you done this before? Nope. <laughs> That's just a little curious because you're coming down the scale. Very nice. Good. Must be an excellent teacher. <laughs> Anybody else? You play tuba, Jacob. Yeah. You can play these anytime you want. I just wanted to mess with the horn one. Oh, we'll we'll mess with it maybe tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else? Any other questions? Well, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for attending this evening. And uh, there'll be time up here if you if you don't want to get it on video, maybe we can cut that and somebody else can play if they really want to. But thank you again. Um, it's been a pleasure. Okay.